Um, thanks for the introduction and for the um, uh, invitation to this great meeting. It's great to see. Uh, it's not working. It, it's great to see so many things happening now in the in you know in the area of data publishing, data data citation. Um, it's great to be part of this uh, data publication spring. And um, you know this this uh, this session's on on flavors of of data use. I thought I'd give a kind of data producer perspective. I'm representing BGI um, in China and uh, and this Giga Science Journal and platform that we're we're putting together. And um, so it's really kind of uh, it'll give a genomics data flavour, um, but hopefully it's useful examples for you know overcoming a lot of these cultural issues that people were discussing earlier. Um, usually I'll do these kinds of talks to a, to a, a genomics audience, so I thought it'd be useful to. Just give a little bit of background ab about you know the data sharing issues in, in genomics. Um, it'll, you know, it'll help put things in in perspective, and maybe talk a little bit about my institution because outside of the field of genomics, people probably haven't heard of it. Um, then I'll kind of give examples of um, you know the data sets we've been playing around with the last year, um, and I'll end up with um, just a little bit of uh, opinionated feedback. That feel free to to take it with a pinch of salt. Um, so. Uh, genomics, everything kind of boils down to the, the Human Genome Project in the, in the 1990s. Um, if, you know, it took, it took over a decade and, and cost $3 billion, and from that, pretty much got one reference genome. Um, but it really helped the field of genomics explode. Um, and, uh, you know, from, a, from this $3 billion price tag, there's been this precipitous drop in, in the cost. This graph is actually a little bit out of date. It's now below $5,000 for a human genome. Um, rapidly approaching a thousand dollars. In genomics conferences, there's basically an embargo on this slide because it's so. Um, people always show it. People play genomics bingo if you show the Moore's law graph, but it is very useful to kind of give, give some perspective of what what the issues are. Um, you know, Moore's law. This is the uh, this, you know, this is a logarithmic scale. It shows the uh, uh, improve you know improvements in computing power. It's a similar shape for computing storage, and uh, particularly since the middle of the last decade, um, the amount of sequencing data has rapidly overtaken this. So this is the issue that everyone in genomics is having to deal with. Um, and this has been led by you know, a couple of technological advances. The, the main one, uh, the mid part of the decade, was the advent of next generation sequencing, or second generation sequencing, that has led to this um, massive, massive uh, you know, in increase of data. In the, it's very interesting at the moment that there's talk of, a th of third generation sequencing. In the last year or two, um, this iron torrent <coughs> have come and that there's talk of them democratizing sequencing. They're much, much cheaper, much, much quicker. Now we can do a, a genome in hours rather than days or weeks. Um, the, the E. coli uh, genome was sequenced on this, for example. And um, in the last month, the last few months, people have got really excited by a potentially a new technology. There's a company called Oxford Nanopore that are promising a uh, genome sequencer that basically is a site, you know, fits in USB drive of, of a laptop, can produce genomes in, in hours with um, no reagents, and they're, they're promising amazing things that people, people haven't actually seen them yet, but um, it's potentially very disruptive technology, and there's lots of cool things happening. Um, at, at, at the moment in, in genomics. Um, so um, tying in with the kind of history of, of genomics, BGI um, basically came out of the Human Genome Project. They, they were founded in, 19, in 1999 to sequence 1% of the human genome, um, but basically on behalf of China. Um, and from that, they've grown to the largest genomics organization in the world. There's about 4,000 employees. And it's a not-for-profit research Institute, but also does commercial sequencing as a service that all of the profits then uh, fund, fund the research side. Um, so it was formerly Beijing Genomics Institute and uh, situated in Beijing, but they've moved now to uh, Shenzhen, which is a town in, in southern China, right on the border with Hong Kong. And in the last few months, I've moved to the Hong Kong office, but moved back and forth. And um, if you look at the sort of global sequencing capacity, BGI is basically this big red dot um, in China. Um, so they have, uh, at one point, they had probably the equivalent sequencing capacity of all of America. I think at the moment, it's probably about a fifth or sixth of the world's capacity with these 130 odd of the most expensive uh, next generation sequences. Um, they churn out data at uh, potentially terabytes a day 
um, if everything's going full speed ahead, they can sequence hundreds, if not thousands, of human genomes a day now. And to be able to cope with these amounts of data, you need uh, you know teraflops of supercomputing power. We have petabytes and petabytes of storage to deal with it. Um, this is the sequencing floor in uh, in Hong Kong, also known as the Chamber of Illuminas. And um, it, this is kind of the closest, uh, it was interesting seeing all these high energy physics talks. This is the closest that biology gets to sort of a, a large hadron collider really. Um, we're, we're, you know, it's producing petabytes a year. I don't think we've quite caught up with CERN, but it's, you know, this rapid growth, um, it, it's, it's, it's gonna happen, you know, shortly. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of challenges de dealing with this obviously. Um, but to, to use the sequencing capacity, the five-year goal at the moment at BGI is these million genome projects to use this capacity to um, uh, basically power through these uh, global mega sequencing projects of uh, G10K is, is you know, 10,000 vertebrate species, 5,000 insect species, um, these big cancer genome consortia, um, looking at kind of microbial ecosystems and, and the like. So there's, there's plenty of things that out there to, for BGI to sequence. Um, and it's topical being here in, in Copenhagen because um, in the last couple of months, BGI has just launched its first European headquarters. Um, they've just opened a sequencing center in the Cobis plant I, I, in, in Copenhagen and they have 10, they've moved 10 of the high seeks here, making it one of the biggest sequencing centers in Europe um, to do things like um, uh, sequence 1% of the Danish population. And there have also been rumors that um, they're looking to sequence the Little Mermaid. Um, <laughs> so um, genomics is often held as a, a, you know, a success story in data sharing. There's a long history since the beginning of the Human Genome Project. The public project was led by a very uh, collaborative um, nematode community who were very used to, to collaborating, working together, and they put this ethos into human genetics, and there was a race against a, a private consortium, but it, they won, or at least um, managed to keep the keep the, the, the data free for the public. And um, it, it, being able to share data in genomics has been helped by, it, it's lucky that there's been a, you know, a very limited number of platforms. Um, there's been a lot of work on data standards, and, and um, possibly Susanna will talk, uh, talk about this um, later in the session. But for a very long time, there's been, uh, you know, there's these very well-established international nucleotide sequencing database consortia repositories, three major ones around the world. Um, the EBR, EMBL bank, for example, has been going since 1980, I think. So, and the, the other centers have got together in the late 80s. So there's been this infrastructure there to really support the community in sharing the data, uh, well-funded for a long period of time. So this, this has obviously helped a lot. Um, and the community uh, from the very beginning uh, got together and, and, and um, made these very well established data sharing policies. Um, all public funded research, uh, they were asking that data was released pretty much immediately to the, to the community. Um, people don't quite keep up with these 24 hour de deadlines and the like now, but it's been, it's been a kind of successful and you, you give your data to the community and the community kind of makes a gentleman's agreement not to um, not to pip you with the first genome-wide paper. They basically, it, this is, this is the, the, the kind of deal, you share your data early, um, but people promise to, to not to publish until you do. And um, later the Toronto Agreement has tried to widen this to other areas of biological research with mixed success, but this is the, this is the kind of long-term goal that has come from, from genomics. Um, obviously these technical challenges, it, obviously the, the, the volumes of data have been the, the, the major one. This green line here, um, the, you know, this is an exponential, this is a logarithmic scale, and, and since 2005, it's just been um, incredibly difficult to keep up with the growth of the, the raw, this is uh, raw next generation sequencing data. And so, this, you know, the system has been successful so far, but there's obviously major challenges in genomics. The, these volumes being obviously the, one of the biggest, you know, being, being able to, to fund all of this. And last year, the NCBI, the, they were uh, you know, debating whether to keep the, 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 the uh, short read archive for, for, for raw data over, and they've got additional funding for this, but long term, it's very difficult. Um, curating this, uh, there can be long backlogs in the amount of time to you know, process all of this data, there are, there are transfer issues. Um, it's been great in this meeting seeing all of the people concentrating on the, on the cultural issues and, and um, obviously, you know, uh, compliance with this is, is, is probably one of the, the major steps. 
Um, and there are issues with interoperability. People, you know, it takes time and effort to, to produce all of this metadata and to, to curate it. It's becoming a bigger and bigger challenge. If there is this democratization of sequencing, there's just going to be a ma much, much um, you know, rapid growth in, in, in the user base. So, so it's a major challenge for the curators to like, deal with this growing number of people. Um, so I, I, th I think it's been covered um, you know, in a few of the talks today about this, this need for the incentives and credit to, to put this additional effort in. Um, it's been discussed in editorials and, and a, a lot of these meetings. And so, you know, at, at, at BGI, at Giga Science, we um, obviously data site and, and data citation uh, fits, really, fits really well here. And, and so with that in mind, um, BGI has been launching this, this Giga Science uh, journal, database, and, and sort of data analysis platform. Um, we're doing it in conjunction with Biomed Central, the open access publisher. So, you know, everything will be open access, open data. And we've got, um, back in Hong Kong, we've got curators and, and people working on this data platform as well. And the first issue of the journal will be early next month. We're, we're just um, doing in the proofing stage now. And so associated with this, we have a data hosting platform. Data sets in the journal um, will, will be hosted and, and, and linked to the articles through this database. But we've also been using this database um, for basically publishing BGI data sets independently. Um, independently of the journal. And so this is, you know, uh, people have been talking about the E. coli example. Over the, over the last year, um, we, you know, we've released a number of data sets. And, and so with the data platform, you can export in, you can, with the database, we'll be able to export to this data platform, uh, which can store workflows and tools. And this is the, this is the ultimate goal for the kind of answer we want to have. It, see things as, as a kind of citable package of data and, and the workflows and, and some kind of description. This is sort of where we, we would like to go. And in the, in the first issue and, and coming this year, we're, we're, we'll have some examples getting close to this. Um, so yeah, go, going through the examples of the, of the data we've released so far um, through the database, kind of, I kind of think there's several things that, that need to be done to, to uh, you know, these culture hurt to overcome a lot of these, uh, overcome a lot of these <laughs> hurdles. And so playing with these data sets, we've tried to see, um, see, see how many of these steps we can kind of uh, uh, work through and, and, um, and, and deal with. Um, now, obviously, uh, data sites is, uh, it, it, it's great seeing so many members now, growing amount of, uh, of DOIs issued, and, and people have been using it in, um, using DOIs in databases for quite a long time. There's a few, you know, there's nice examples going back um, uh, six, seven years of, of uh, DOIs being cited in, in uh, you know, science, for example. Um, PDB has been using DOIs for a long time, although people haven't been citing these data sets, but even then have managed to find some examples of people citing PDB DOIs. And, and so, you know, obviously there's a growing user base. Um, so we've, uh, in the last year, we've released about 35 data sets, um, mostly genomes, um, some, you know, transcriptome data, epigenome data, slightly different types of data, but all sort of genome related. Um, Think sequence at BGI. One of the one of the, we've got this cancer data set that's 14 terabytes. Um, that's uh, uh, very interesting. And, and a lot of these we've released pre-publication, um, you know, before the before the papers have come out to see just to see the sort of downstream consequences of this. The one that people have been mentioning was our very first DOI. Um, uh, so it, uh, at BGI with this super fast next next generation sequencers. Um, we sequenced the um, we sequenced the, the the strain of this E. coli that kills about 50 people in Germany, and before it even finished uploading to NCBI, we thought basically we have to get this data out as quickly as possible. We released it on the internet actually via Twitter. Um, we gave it a public domain waiver to maximise the use, but thought. Uh, it'd be really useful to at least give people a mechanism to cite it if they if they so desired, and so we issued it with a with a data set DOI. Um, it was really interesting putting it on Twitter because immediately people started using this data, swapping it between themselves. Within 24 hours, people had been producing their own assemblies, their own annotations. Um, as some of the bloggers have said that E. coli is potentially the first tweenome um, from the from the way that this. Um, <laughs> This research was done, and um, a a, so a, a group of the people were posting their results 
on their blogs, and um, eventually they ended up in a GitHub repository. Um, about 20 groups around the world were, were, within the first couple of weeks, putting really useful analysis there. And um, it, it was a lot of fun being there and releasing subsequent data sets on, on Twitter and, and, and seeing all of this um, uh, fa fantastic work. And it, it got a lot of great attention for BGI, um, but importantly for a research in, um, institution, it, you know, it didn't stop publication in, um, in a journal as prestigious as New England Journal of Medicine. It's a 200-year-old uh, journal, usually very conservative about things such as pre-publication, um, pre-publication, you know, announcement of results and things like that. But they they had no problems with um, with you know the data being uh, citable before publication, and they even specifically highlighted the, the this in the article. You know, it was it was about open source genomics. So that was um, you know that, that was a nice sign that the journals do not have problems with. This um, and this was exactly a year ago, and it's not been nice to kind of follow the the, the use of this data um, within five days of the data being released. There were diagnostic primers released. Um, there's subsequently been papers uh, on uh, antimicrobial agents that were developed um, using the using the the raw data that that was released. There's been platform comparison papers because everybody other groups started releasing their data. Um, in this open license, it allowed, it allowed these kind of platform comparisons. And um, one thing I was most encouraged about was a paper in, in Nature uh, a month or two ago um, where a, a different group who were also working on E. coli at Pacific Biosystems, um, because everybody else had released their data in, under this um, uh, uh, Creative Commons license in this way, it allowed them to basically, um, it allowed free use of the data and they, uh, they could basically bypass all of the lawyers and release their data in exactly the same way. And, you know, it, saving a couple of days in a, in a crisis like this saves lives, really. Um, so that was, that was um, a, a really nice downstream consequence. Um, so it's great to see, you know, there's been a lot of talks here uh, from publishers, people, um, lots of talk about, about data journals. So, it's, you know, you can see, obviously, the, the journals are, are, are getting very interested in this, and, and they're obviously going to accept it if they are producing their own journals. Um, so we've been talking to a, a number of journals about their policies um, about you know pre-publication release of data and F1000 research have systematically talked to um, uh, lots of the publishers and, and so far I think only Cell has had problems with that. Most of the other journals have, have been been fine and we've already had you know presentations today um, plugging zoo keys. Um, there's the uh, geosciences data journal launching and um, yeah there's, there's 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 more and more interest in this. Um, and so we've had a few problems getting DOIs into the, into the references of papers. We, we've had no problems, um, journals uh, linking, linking to DOIs. We've had some nature journals and science do that with some of our, some of our data sets. Um, but our first success getting the, you know, for data citation to work and actually people citing the data, our first success was with, um, with the sorghum genome. Um, so we submitted it to, there are six data types in this paper, we submitted it to four NCBI databases, um, and, then, and at the same time we issued a, issued a DOI, and it kind of complemented themselves, they kind of complemented the process quite well. People could immediately access the data with the DOI, NCBI databases curate it really well, but for example, the SNP database, it's nine months on, I think it's still not public because it takes such a long time to build, to release new database builds and the like. So um, we, we sort of, you know, combined the traditional form of data release with, with this DOI, and then we worked very closely with the editors and production people at Genome Biology. So they, in the references, cited the, um, cited the DOI following the, the strict, uh, you know, DCC, best practice and data site guidelines for how, you know, exactly how you should cite the data. Um, BMC actually used this as their example in their instructions for authors now about how, you know, how data should be cited. And after this, um, we got uh, Nature Biotechnology. Um, this is a very interesting paper about uh, RNA editome. It's quite a controversial area in, in, in molecular biology, but um, it was useful having all of the, the data supporting it we made it available on on uh, on on our GigaDB, and and there's a, a, gig, a um, data site DOI in the references of that. So you know, it's it's nice seeing the, the journals kind of supporting this now and not having any problems. 
And subsequently to this, you know, we're now seeing it in more and more journals, starting to cite Dryad, DOIs correctly, um, even Figshare, which I've just heard has uh, started taking data site DOIs, even their handles have been correctly cited in, in PLOS One. So people are, you know, th this is one of the culture hurdles that, that seems to, uh, seem to have uh, been bypassed now. So we, we kind of, th these first couple of steps, it seems that the community is sort of uh, ready, ready for these things. It's the, the, the next two are, are, are more of a, seem to be more of a challenge um, for, from, from our perspective. So the metadata, the, the data set metadata search function is very useful. You know, it makes your data more discoverable. Um, and it produces it in a OAA PMH harvestable form. But when we were talking to Google Scholar, and there are data site DOIs in Google Scholar, but um, when we asked them if they could include our DOIs, they were saying, well, they don't take data sets. It's, it's in, for scholarly, even though it's set up, uh, to be able to take data site DOIs, um, and there are data site DOIs in there, they actually potentially want to remove them, which is a, which is a, a bit of a shame, really. Um, and it's just a kind of policy thing that it should be, e you know, should be easy to overcome. But this is um, this is something that I think potentially needs addre addressing. Um, you know, talking to some of these citation indices, it does sound like that um, it, it's almost there with. Uh, you know, the, uh, some of the other citation indices taking it, and, and I've heard Microsoft and, and Total Impact are, are working on the moment, but this, I think is the, this is kind of the next step that would be really useful to, to, to address next, to, you know, and, and the tracking will basically allow the, 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 it'll make the metrics much, much easier. The, the bibliometric, you know, the bibliometrics people, people like Heather Piawar, they've sort of tried to track use of, of, um, of, of data DOIs, and, and they've kind of concluded, really, that it's very difficult, if not almost impossible, to kind of, uh, other than sticking things in Google, um, to, to kind of track the, track the downstream use. And um, in Google, uh, Heather's blog uh, last month, she was saying, you know, if, we, if we're making promises that, you know, uh, release your data in this way, make it citable, uh, and, and people are doing it, um, we really need to, in, you know, we're making people these promises, but nobody's actually indexing them at the moment. So it, it, it's a bit of a shame. I think this would be, you know, th these final two steps are the, 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 the next two things that, I don't know, from my view, uh, need to be addressed now to, you know, overcome these last couple of cultural hurdles. Um, so yeah, I, th I think this is sort of uh, where we are in, in, in 2012. Um, little minor feedback on the, you know playing with these data site DOIs over the last year. Um, when we've tried to uh, export the export the citations from the from the data site uh, metadata search into Zotero and Mendeley, it sort of works, but the formatting is a little bit wrong. That's like I don't know if that's Zotero and Men Mendeley's fault or fault with the way I've got it set up, but that was one minor problem we had. And um, every time we've had issues with versioning and granularity and things like that, um, contacting the you know, uh, data site help, has been, they've been very useful and helped us, but it'd be nice to have, uh, you know, as the user base grows, it'd be nice to have uh, much clearer guidelines uh, uh, about these things, uh, you know, about versioning. Granularity, we've been, the things we've, because our things are being integrated into papers, we're currently citing kind of paper-shaped objects. There are people, you know, the nano publication people are talking about giving DOIs to individual facts and assertions in the literature, which there could be 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14 of these. That's probably too much, but, you know, I, things are gonna have to kind of eventually settle somewhere in between where, where people cite, cite data, and it'd be, yeah, interesting to, hear people's kind of views on this and see, see how it evolves. Um, so if people are interested in all of this, we do have a, a correspondence in um, the BMC data standards and sharing um, series in, in research notes on this. And um, so GigaScience, the actual journal that we'll be launching, uh, yeah, probably 12th, 13th of July. We've been proofing up all of the articles and um, we have a nice example. Um, you know, there were discussions about supplemental, supplemental files. We have a research paper where we're hosting um, all of the associated data and tools with this genomics pipeline. Under a, we will be issuing a data site DOI to it. 
It's about 84 gig uh, supplemental file. Working with Susanna, we're making it in our ISOTAB compliant format. And with our data platform, we can integrate about 80% of all of the methods into this workflow system. So we, we haven't managed to get a, like a, comp a completely uh, executable paper yet, but that, that will be coming later in the year. So this is uh, watch, out for, watch out for all of this. Um, and yeah, if people have uh, interesting large care biological data sets, come and talk to us. And we're also um, hosting a, a, a session on, on reproducible research at the end of the year in Shenzhen, if people are interested as well. So with that, I'd just like to thank um, everybody at BGI for supporting this endeavor. Um, we have collaborators in a couple of the Hong Kong universities. It's been great working with DataSite and ISATAB and do we have time for questions or not?